Just gonna clean that off. Hi everybody, welcome to Ask the Exec for another week. Um, I know it's a half term for a lot this week, and um, so there might be a slightly smaller audience, but you're very welcome. Um, today on the call, um, joining us, I've got um, Claire Tini, Exec Director of People and Culture, and Julie Atfield, Exec Director for Mental Health Learning Disabilities. And I also got uh, Yolanda Martins, who might be a new face and name to some of you, um, who's our new Associate Director of Communications and Engagement. So, um, as usual, we'll do um, a very brief summary roundup of the current situation, and then we'll go to um, some questions that we've had sent in already. Um, and if you've got other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll have a go at answering them if we can't. Um, We'll, we'll get answers um, during the week. So um, in brief summary, um, you'll all be aware um, that we we seem to be well past the peak of the latest wave. We can see the numbers on the, the number of new cases, uh, the number of people requiring hospital admission, and to some extent, some extent the number of deaths starting to fall. The number of new cases is falling um, very significantly, as are the numbers being admitted into critical care um, right across the country. Um, sadly, the, the, the number of deaths is um, stubbornly high, but the predictions are that they'll start to fall um, significantly too over the next few weeks. Um, you'll also see that the NHS was successful in reaching the first um, milestone in the vaccination programme. Um, 15 million by last Sunday, and I think over um, we're, we're, it was half a million over that um, that number. So that was a, a fantastic achievement, and I'm sure that um, all our health and social care people will will feel a tiny bit proud of contributing to that in whatever role that, that they've been involved in. And it is a truly tremendous achievement um, to go from a standing start of nothing from just before Christmas to um, the, the programme that we've got um, rolling out at the moment. Fantastic national achievement. And within the county, um, we had a bit of catch up because we, we had we were a bit slow to start for various technical reasons, but the numbers now we're over 240,000 vaccinated um, across the, the various vaccination sites and hospital hubs. Roving teams, all the infrastructure behind that is is going well. Um, so massive thank you to everybody that's been involved in supporting that program. It's going to be with us for some time. Um, we're moving into the next cohort. Um, importantly to note that um, the cohort of um, cohort six, the clinically vulnerable, um, includes you know a very large proportion of the people that we see in our services um, in community um, day settings, and we've started um, a program to identify. Um, those people and the process that we can put in place to enable them to receive their vaccine in short order over the next week or so. Um, that's a that's a slightly more complex piece of work because the very nature of the, of the people that will require the, the vaccine. Um, but um, we're well on course to hit the numbers for that. So that's another piece of really good news. Um, in house. Um, that we've still got um, a, a number of outbreaks that are open. I think 12 as of this morning. Um, the last one um, was a quite a significant one over at um, John Eastwood Hospice. Um, but they're all being uh, well managed. And again, um, recognising and appreciating the, 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 the effort staff are putting in to, to minimise those and to continue to practise the, the art of wearing PPE, maintaining social distancing in, in some of our clinical settings must be uh, really challenging. So thank you for that. Um, in, in other news, things continue to um, progress. There's lots of other work that isn't necessarily COVID related that um, I know people are, are, are getting on with. There's some big transformation schemes that, we, that I mentioned briefly last week. There's the national um, annual planning programme for um, the the next financial year 
um, 21, 22, which is um, taxing a lot of people about um, the plans from the strategy and the spend. Um, that's going well. Um, and then the, the um, sorry, I'm just jumping around a little bit. I, what I wanted to mention with relation to the pandemic is um, there's a question asked uh, a couple of weeks ago about um, the availability of, of COVID clinics, long COVID clinics. Um, so we've just got the go ahead to set up uh, um, clinics in the county. Um, there'll be a one in North and South, predominantly virtual, but not solely, that will kick off on the 28th of February. Very much a pilot um, and very much sort of based in a, in a, um, a multidisciplinary setting um, that will enable people to um, be triaged and um, put in contact with services that are already up and running. We've got very little idea of demand and how that will play out and um, we've got some funding to support it and um, I think it'll be a really important part of the the armamentorium for for managing all different aspects of Covid. Um, we, at, we were asked a question as, uh, a week or two ago as to whether um, staff would be prioritised for this um, we haven't got an answer for that yet and um, we've only just got this um, news that we're going to be able to set one up and, and get it going so um, that's a question that we'll need to consider um, in, in some depth before um, we land to a position on that but good news in terms of being able to have that facility up and running. Um, so that's that's the end of my sort of brief summary introduction I'm going to go to Claire who's going to just give us um, a bit more detail on the news around the expansion of the numbers of um, of shielders and the, and the changing definitions for that that was announced nationally the other day. So Claire, over to you. Thanks, John. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us. So yes, a couple of things. As John said, um, just on vaccination, first of all, it's going really well. Over 5,000 staff have received the vaccination and we continue to encourage our staff to access the vaccine um, and book yourselves on. Um, aligned to that yesterday in the communications in terms of John's daily comms, we put out some information about links for colleagues to join in case they got queries about the vaccine. Um, particularly had some queries from our BME members of staff um, raising specific questions. So there'll be a number of sessions over the next few days where people can get more advice and guidance if there's something that you um, want to clarify. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to do a bit of a, a shout out about those and say please share those details with people and encourage them to, to join. Um, yesterday there was some further guidance issued about um, people who need to shield and the shielding period extended. Um, the guidance relates to um, people's personal circumstances that may influence their need to shield, for example, their age, their BMI, their gender, um, ethnicity. Uh, so a number of other things. The guidance has come out today, so we are in a position to be able to relook at that and we will be issuing some further details later today in the communications. And if people have got any particular questions, they can get in touch with the um, staff health and wellbeing line and we'll be happy to talk some of those through with you. If you are at home and you're shielding, you do not have to wait for a letter to access your vaccine. You can book on. So we'll reaffirm those details as well later today in the comms um, so, so that people are clear about how and where they can access their vaccination from. I think that was everything from me, John, by way of an update. Happy to take any questions if they come through. Thanks, Claire. Um, so, Alex, that's intros over. If you want to then um, coordinate us through the, the Q&A that we've, that we've got. Absolutely. Thanks, John. I've um, just we haven't had that many questions. So if anybody wants to put any in the chat or put the hand up, please do so. Um, and um, there's a um, question which is saying, um, had my COVID vaccine on Friday afternoon. I've been experiencing extreme side effects yesterday and today. Nausea, no energy, aching all over. Um, throbbing headache and then vomiting. I'm just wondering if this is normal. I've never had this with any jab and I've had my flu jabs fine with no reactions. Will the same thing happen when I have the second jab? I don't know if Julie you want to answer this. 
Yes, I'm happy to, Alex. Um, uh, it seems to be that, um, I mean, people are widely dis describing the same side effects um, and their, their own management of them, really. Um, apparently about 70 percent, uh, sorry, 40 percent of people who've had the AstraZeneca vaccine have had side effects. They tend to be of that nature and relatively mild um, and they should resolve in 48 hours. I think people have resorted to paracetamol and so forth. Um, and at the moment, it's positive that the evidence suggests that on your second dose, um, it's likely to be more mild. So I think a lot of people have had that experience and are anticipating um, it might happen again um, when they have their second dose. But it's looking like uh, the side the side effects after the second dose will be more mild. So that's it as we know it at the moment. That's great, thank you. Um, and um, linked again, um, again with that, with side effects of the of the jab. There's a question that's come in, which is um, it's from Facebook, but it says, um, "Anyone know the whole penicillin issues with the vaccines?" <laughs> yeah, so, Julie, I'm going to yeah, I'm going to answer this because I'm I'm allergic to penicillin, so um, I've I've always been looking at this um, ever since. The vaccine program started um, and you know with people like me and anybody else who's got an allergy like that I think we're looking at the beginning and it has become very clear that people with those allergies like anaphylaxis to food, insect bites, uh, medicines can proceed with the vaccine. Um, it's a the 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 issue about the allergy is are you allergic to any component of the vaccine? So, what you do see through the process of of getting your vaccine is you're asked several times about your allergies, but it shouldn't pre prevent you from going and booking because you can proceed in the main absolutely to get your vaccine. And those sort of common allergies like penicillin don't prevent you from having it so uh, but it's always make that known as part of the process that's great thank you ever so much fair. julie thank you um and i don't know if um john wants to answer this at all but there's a question that's been um asked just about the command and control situation um so you've mentioned before that the nhs is in a command and control situation can you describe what this means for you on a day-to-day -day basis i know you've touched on this previously before john um but i think it just give a good insight as to what's happening um, and for example how does Matt, how does what Man, Matt Hancock um, say work through to the front line? Thanks. Thanks Alex. Yeah Alex you need to make sure you don't trip up when you when you when you um, say Matt Hancock's name. Um, the um, as someone famously did on Radio 4 when introducing him once um, look it up on YouTube, I'm sure it's on there. Um, the, that's a really good question. Um, and just, I, I suppose I'd, I'd answer it by, by sort of just very briefly running through what normal, um, what normally happens in, in the NHS. So um, by, by it's, it's the way it works, it is quite a centralised um, organisation as people will, um, will be aware um, and that that top office is the Department of Health. Uh, the chief executive um, is Simon Stevens, uh, or Sir Simon Stevens, um, and he's accountable to um, the Secretary of State for Health, uh, Matt Hancock. Um, that the, the, the command structure then flows from the national team to the regions. Um, we're in the Midlands region and there is a regional team of, of NHS England improvement people that has a, a single regional director as is uh, a chap called Dale Bywater and there are there's a there's like a board structure with a, a lead med, a direct, a medical director a nursing director etc um, and they coordinate each of the systems within the region 
Um, within the Midlands, there are 11, of which we're one, um, Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. Um, and ordinarily, they, they would oversee and guide us through our performance activity and oversight of the money. Um, some things are quite tightly monitored. Um, key performance indicators would be, you know, what's a national priority, for example, make sure that the money's um, tight um, and accounted for. Um, but ordinarily, there's quite a bit of flexibility in terms of being a foundation trust, um, for example. We have the degree of autonomy to um, do things that we think are important for our, our patients and service users. Um, we might go a bit further on in some things, we might focus on different areas and within reason there's there's permission to um, to do that. What's happened um, in the pandemic is there are different levels of command and, and um, the NHS is in level four, which is dubbed command and control. And in essence, it takes away uh, the vast majority of that autonomy. Um, hence, um, for example, in the acute hospitals in, in the first wave, they were um, essentially instructed to stop the vast majority of their day-to-day um, -to -day elective programmes, clear the hospitals to enable um, all the COVID patients to be admitted. And that's been different in um, the second and third waves, um, but that's something they had very little say, if any say on. That was the command, do it. Well, it's been, diff been different in mental health because we don't have the same acute emergency elective um, distinction. So most of our services continued, um, although often or often in a, in a different format. Um, so in essence, that's what it is that um, we have been commanded to provide 15 million vaccines by the 15th of February. Um, and, and there's no debate, there's no discussion, there's no sort of views about how you could do it better or how, how this is what you're doing, get on with it and we'll make sure that we hold the ring on it and hold you to account on it. Um, and that's the difference really. I hope that um, gives you a bit of a fla flavour of it. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much, John. Um, there's a question that um, Kumar has um, has um, added to the chat um, and which Tracy has, has answered in part. Um, he, it, the question is, are we having any data to show the uptake of, vac of COVID vaccine among BAME staff? Alex, I can pick that up if you, if you like. Yeah, thank you, Claire. So, so the answer to that is yes. So, um, because the staff have been able to book on to the vaccine through a number of different vaccination centres, um, we've had to collate the data on who's taken the vaccine up and we've had to ma match that to the vaccine record. And that hasn't been straightforward to do. So, as a kind of, um, we, we've just got to the point actually in the last day or so where we've got some better information about that. So I haven't got the final figure, but I do know that Tracy Orlandi is going to be talking to the BME staff network about that, um, I think tomorrow, and we can get the details out about the uptake of the vaccine. So we have now got that information, unless Tracy can put something in the chat that gives us an indication of the figure today of BME staff. But yeah, we will be in a position to, to look at that, along with the staff that we understand to be clinically extremely vulnerable. That's great. Thank you ever so much, Claire. Um, and John, we've had um, quite a complex question about PCR tests. Um, I don't know if you wish to, if you're able to um, shed any light on, on this. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, so um, I, I referred to my previous answer on um, a, a number of the comments in the question. I won't read it all out, it's quite lengthy, but there's, there's a couple of um, important points that are raised, which uh, I think are relatively new and, and I think important probably to um, to, re, to restate. Um, and it relates to um, patients who test positive 
who don't have, well, or anybody, not necessarily patients, but for the sake of us, it's patients who may test positive, who have no symptoms, being treated as if um, they have COVID and being put in COVID areas or COVID part or COVID wards. Um, and for me, that that's one of the sort of essential essences of, of this condition that make it so tricky to manage because um, there are, we know there are, I don't know the exact percentage number, but there are very many people who um, have viral load and virus in their system who, who exhibit no overt symptoms at all. Um, and there, there are studies that when you talk to that broad group and do an extensive questionnaire, then you might find some mild um, respiratory symptoms or something similar. But um, that's the biggest challenge, that there are a lot of people that have it um, who are asymptomatic. But the, the biggest um, challenge of that is not knowing that means that they are liable to transmit it um, and they don't and they don't transmit the asymptomatic version. So they might spread the virus unbeknownst to them um, to a vulnerable or a person for whatever reason who then gets um, very severe symptoms. And that's made it really difficult to to get ahead of the curve on it and why um, testing is so important and um, it's, you know, we know it's not 100% accurate, but both the PCR and lateral flow testing are, are again, really important tools to have um, so that we can identify some of those people that would be potentially spreading it um, in our teams and on our wards. That's great. Thank so, you very much, John. You're welcome. And that, so that's the the first part of it and the, and the second part again is a, is a really good question um, as I've got the mic I'll, I'll command you Alex to, to let me read the question now. Um, will the trust be keeping stats on patients who become ill or test positive after receiving the first or both shots of vaccine? There have been reports in um, care homes of, um, of deaths sadly of residents who've had the vaccine and there are a number of countries that aren't using it in um, over 65s. So again, that's that's a really good example of command and control. So um, the, the, there's the um, Joint Committee of Vaccines have instructed um, through the Department of Health to um, undertake the vaccine programme as described, um, and that will happen. Um, there are obviously checks and balances, but from our perspective, um, we'll carry out that instruction. In terms of um, people that still be coming ill after they've had one or both vaccines, um, that would be predicted anyway from the, from the data within the studies. So we know that um, the efficacy of, of the different vaccines is slightly different. Um, and there are slightly different levels of immunity following the first and second vaccines. Um, I, again, I can't remember all the numbers off the top of my head, but anyway, I think between high 60s and 90% efficacy. So we know there's going to be a significant minority of people who, despite having both shots, um, will not avoid becoming infected. The data suggests that it massively reduces the severity um, and therefore the number of deaths. Uh, proportionally if you're vaccinated compared to if you're not but there will still be people who sadly die um, and in, to answer the specific question yes we will be keeping um, numbers on this because it's a really important part of the ongoing um, sort of surveillance of how effective the vaccines are actually in real life compared to um, research conditions so again, we'll be um, making sure that, that that data is collated and shared. Thanks ever so much, John. There's a couple of questions that have been put on the chat and I'll just come to Amanda's first. Um, and I don't know if you want to respond to this uh, verbally, Claire, as well. Does the COVID vaccination data collected by the Trust include those staff who have had their vaccines completed via their GP? And I know you've mentioned this in the chat already, Claire, but 
Yeah, thanks, Alex. So, um, yeah, when when I, I spoke earlier and I said about um, colleagues have been able to access the vaccination through a number of different um, centres um, and, and also on some occasions via their own GP. And so um, we are, as of yesterday, in a position now to be able to correlate the, the records which give us the, the detail of the staff that have been vaccinated via the different routes. So we've got um, better oversight of that and um, so yes it we we will be able to, to pick that up i would just want to reiterate though that is about us understanding our overall numbers and to see if there are any staff groups or particular areas where we need to promote the vaccine and promote access to the vaccine it is not about picking up with individuals as a consequence of of having that information just to be clear about the reasons why that's great. Thank you ever so much. And um, Sue was um, put in the chat. Um, the current situation must have added so much additional pressures to your own roles. How to how to you how to you all make how do you all maintain your resilience in these times with constant changes and demands? Claire, I don't know if you want to answer that first. Uh, block John Bruin on your phone. I'm joking. Uh, so <laughs> one has to adapt the strategies that that work for us. No, um, it's a really good question actually, and I think um a couple of things for me just to share personally. Um, and it has taken its toll because I'm somebody that does like to exercise, and I like to get my exercise or or did um by going to the the gym and that served two purposes a it kept me fit but there was a really good little community of people that i used to engage there and see so i've really missed that and um but what i've been quite keen to do is make sure that i put in some other things as well so getting outside having some exercise uh, making sure that I still stay in in touch um in the ways that i can um albeit via zoom and things with the people that are close to me. So I suppose the key message is, is just thinking about the things that work for each of us um, to help get us through. I think it's been dif difficult for everybody in lots of different ways. Um, so yeah, that's 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 been something for me. Thank you ever so much. Julie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I've heard quite a lot of colleagues talking about similar things over recent weeks. Um, I think a lot of us have been doing the same thing about sort of prioritising and working differently. I think everybody misses the interaction, the human face to face interaction that inevitably we were all, uh, you know, we all did as or do as part of our roles and some of us can't do that in the same way. So I think it's been about how to replace that with some other other types of support, really. Um, I think we all are finding ways of doing that um, and I've talked to a lot of community teams for example and I think it's something that we should actively encourage uh, people to catch up informally um, as part of the day especially when they're working in quite an isolated way and that's something that I think as an exec team we've started to do more so um, of late um bit like Claire, I try and exercise. Claire recommended what running shoes I should buy last year. <laughs> and I've got I did get some and they are they are pretty good. So uh, uh, I've still been trying to do some of that. Um one thing that I've personally found very recently is um uh, to take your leave. Um I had last week off. I couldn't go anywhere. I drove the family mad by decorating around them, and um, but it did me the power of good. So I, I, I would say, you know, whilst you can't, Claire Tini's just said keep on running. <laughs> I don't go very far, so uh, but I do go. So I, I just think it's to try and find some pleasure in doing some things outside of work that, um, you know, that can replace um some of the some of the things that we enjoy doing anyway and it makes you feel better all around so so i think it's a bit of a mixture um that's that's what i would say excellent thank you john i don't know if you want to add anything to that i know that when this question was asked previously you talked about sharpening knives i don't know if that's something that you 
continuing to do <laughs> on a regular basis. That must have been a bad day. <laughs> 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 the exec team misbehaving again. Um, no, that, that was because um, it's a standing joke in our house that um, instead of ever sharpening them, just buy a new one. So we've got a drawer full of blunt ones. Um, but um, unfortunately, whilst um, it was the, my priority list to do for a weekend, it didn't get done. So um, I must have entertained myself in another way um, that weekend. So I still got said drawer full of blunt knives. Um, I, I just echo... Um, what Claire and, and Julia said really, um, more broadly for the organisation is really important. We encourage people to where they can to take their leave. Um, and the importance of a break away, despite the fact, as, as people have said, there's not a massive amount of the traditional things to do. It's really important to get, a, a, um, even if it's just for a day or two, um, time out and um, time away from, um, from the work job role and off the screens um, and we'll continue to to encourage people to do that um, people will know there is a facility if required to carry some leave over which we've um, agreed through for this financial year and um, that the, the priority is to take leave where you can um, likewise whilst when i'm not um sharpening knives um i do the usual things i do i hard to believe I do run um, on a regular basis and um, I, li I like to cook spend a bit of time in the kitchen and um, chopping vegetables I made some really nice um, onion gravy last night to go with my liver much to much to um, <laughs> my daughter's consternation um, but I like it and it's good for you um, <laughs> stuff like that That's there you go bad. Thank you ever so much. We haven't got any any other questions, so unless anybody wishes to add anything to the chat, um, but is there is there anything else that that any of you would like to say in way of a summary? I mean, I, I, again, uh, as ever, um, Alex, it's really important to to recognise that the the effort people are putting in. Um, I think everybody's feeling it a bit, aren't they, in terms of um, it can feel a bit Groundhog Day and um, talking into computers, but um, just to emphasise, um, the organisation is in a good position. Um, people are doing fantastic work. Um, the, the days are getting lighter and the daffodils are out and the vaccination programme will begin to have an impact um, and um, we, we will get through this and things will, will gradually start to improve. Um, and it's obviously a big week next week, isn't it, with the the Prime Minister's sort of announcement on um, starting to define um, some milestones for the for the coming weeks and months. So fingers crossed, and thank you to everybody for what for what they're doing. Thank you ever so much, John. Claire's just put in the chat. Thank you to everyone for what you were doing. Keep safe. Don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to to add to that, Claire or Julie. No, just to say, as, as I say, to reiterate that um, it's it's been a, a tough year for people at work and on a personal front. Um, we can it, say and thank you. We can never say it enough. Um, but everything that you're doing, um, we do really appreciate. Make sure you appreciate yourself and each other. And just to say, take care and, and look after you and yours, really. Thank you ever so much. And Julie's just said big underline from me, so thank you. And then Sue's put execs, thanks for your personal comments. Totally agree with all of them, apart from the liver, which I I, I know that Sue's uh, gone vegan recently. So yeah, that's definitely not going to be on, on her radar. So, oh dear. Um, so thank you all very much. And um, if anybody's got any questions if, uh, for next week, if you want to add them to send them in through staff engagement, then we'll be able to we'll be able to add those um, to the questions. But thank you ever so much and uh, and see you next week. Thanks to Thanks, you, Alex, Alex, too. Bye. Have a Bye. good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.